Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to start with some statistics. 90% of the world's data has been produced in the last two years. So if you think about it, in the 6,000 years since humanity started writing down information, 90% of it has been produced in the last two years. And if you come into my world, into biomedicine, every day thousands of papers are uploaded into portals like PubMed. New genome sequences, new biomarkers, new clinical trial data. We are drowning in data. But for all that data, we're not being successful at answering society's needs for new medicines. We haven't been successful in new drugs for Alzheimer's, for osteoporosis, for many cancers. So why are scientists drowning in data? Well, your average scientist can read between 200 to 400 papers a year. And so when they're coming up with new research ideas, they're actually trawling through a very narrow evidence base. And they're also bringing quite a narrow, although very deep, perspective to the analysis of that evidence base. This has been fine until we've got this explosion of data. And now scientists are failing to pick the best hypothesis because they can't access the huge wealth of data that we, they need to. Scientists need AI to make them smarter. And this is nowhere more true than in the pharmaceutical industry. Do you know that most people in the pharmaceutical industry never work on a drug that makes it to the market? Of those compounds that actually make it to clinical trials in patients, the first clinical trials in patients, 50% fail because they don't work. They lack efficacy. And of those drugs that go on to bigger trials, nearly 50% of those fail for lack of efficacy. 25% of the reason uh, of the drugs are terminated in clinical development for strategic or commercial reasons. What that tells me is a failure of efficacy in a patient means we do not understand that disease well enough. A failure of efficacy for commercial, or, uh, for commercial uh, stoppage for commercial or strategic reasons means we don't understand the patient's needs, the unmet medical needs, well enough. Bad decisions are made on the basis of poor evidence. And I believe for an evidence-based industry, the pharmaceutical company use very little of the available evidence. Which brings me on to what's been going on behind me. This is where AI comes in. To give you a sense of the scale of what happens every day, the life science paper is uploaded every 30 seconds. By the whole day, you're talking about nearly 3,000 pieces of scientific literature. And this is just represented behind me. One person couldn't read that in 10 years, let alone one day. And that's not counting all the other types of data, the genetic data, the biomedical imaging, etc., that I mentioned earlier. We have to do things differently. What if a scientist could access all this data in a day, or even less than a day? What if a scientist could begin to pull all the data in from different sources, integrate it, and really be able to answer new and important questions about disease? Think of the impact on the industry, the impact on drug discovery, the impact for society and patients. This is something we at Benevolent AI are committed to and we do every day. I'll tell you a little bit more about how we do it in a moment, but why it's important. I mentioned earlier about the issues the industry has. I believe the model as we do now is broken. I said many people don't work on a drug that makes it to market. 90% of clinical candidates fail in clinical development. It's not sustainable. Also, payers, many of whom are the governments that pay for the basic biomedical research that the companies use, are beginning to question this high failure rate and lack of innovation. And indeed, industry leaders like the head of Regeneron acknowledge there is a failure of innovation in the industry. The pace of innovation has not kept up with the pace of information. And that needs to change. 
And that's what we're trying to do at Benevolent. We take the corpus of biomedical information that we can lay our hands on, public information, proprietary information, information we pay to access. We take that, ingest that, curate it with our deep domain expertise, annotate it, and then use artificial intelligence to build a huge knowledge graph of relationships that are known, over a billion relationships in the biomedical corpus. And then we use our AI to analyze that information and say, given these known relationships, what relationships might be true but have not yet been discovered? The analogy we use is that we, um, if, when you think about when the periodic table of the elements was built, there were gaps. There were gaps because there are elements where they should exist, but they were not yet known. What we're looking at is the analogy here for biomedical facts and data that should exist, but are not yet uncovered. And we use that to discover new approaches to important biomedical problems. And I'm going to talk about one example of work where we've carried out very early on, actually, in the construction of our platform for a very serious disease called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, or you may know it as Lugiris disease or motor neuron disease. This is a disease that kills people within two to five years. It has a devastating effect on them, the patients and their families. And the current standard of care only prolongs life by three to six months. Our scientists who have no prior knowledge and experience of working in ALS ran the ALS query over our platform. She took the hypotheses that were generated in a few hours and looked at these hypotheses and did a deep dive using our other tools of the platform to be able to rank those hypotheses and really test them out to make sure that they made sense. She had a wealth to choose from, but she chose five, the top five, and she took them to a specialist research institute the Sheffield Institute for Translational Neuroscience. Here, they've been working for years to try and come up with new therapies for ALS. And they were amazed because of those five hypotheses or potential new approaches to treatment we took, they had actually come up with one of them independently, but it would take them two years for them to come up with that hypothesis. They hadn't published it, and so they were quite amazed that we actually came up with that hypothesis independently in a couple of weeks. We tested our five hypotheses in their model, which uses stem cells from patients, and we showed that one didn't work, three worked as well as standard of care, which, as you know, does not prolong life by much, and one worked very well indeed, and we took that into a preclinical model of the disease and were able to show that it had a delay on symptom onset. We're now optimizing that uh, approach and hopefully we'll come up with a better molecule and we can move much more rapidly to the clinic. And we've got other examples of that. And I think it's, uh, for me, it's just transformational being able to get this access to all this information. For me, this liberates myself and my scientists to be able to ask questions that we haven't been able to ask before because we haven't had this integrated data set and we haven't been able to use the unbiased nature of the technology to pick the data, the best data, to answer the question from anywhere. So I think this isn't about replacing scientists. This is about augmenting scientists, allowing them to operate in a completely new way and actually really explore exciting new hypotheses in diseases. It also democratizes the process. It brings the source of the information very close to the scientist in ways that it hasn't hitherto not been possible. I'd also say that as well as reducing uncertainty by creating better biological hypotheses in diseases, we are also able to create better molecules much more rapidly and make the process more efficient. When you have a hypothesis and you have a potential starting point in chemistry, you want to come up with a drug that's a compound that will be a drug. And it needs to have certain properties. It mustn't be toxic. It must get into the right bit of the body. It must last for the right amount of time. And what we can do by mining the corpus of the chemical information 
is we can virtually screen many molecules. And so in the end, we only need to test about 10% of them, actually make and test about 10% of them. So we make 400 as opposed to 4,000. And we get to a candidate in a year as opposed to two to three. So this is a very exciting approach. I think it can really change the way we do drug discovery. There's been a lot of hype about AI, and some of it may not be justified. But I think for healthcare in general, and for drug discovery in particular, AI is going to have a tremendous impact. Without AI, we will not be able to progress our new medicines and get those new medicines to patients faster. We will not have a sustainable industry. And I believe that if we embrace this technology and really uh, open ourselves up to new ways of working that it brings, we will ultimately be of benefit, not just to the industry, but for patients everywhere. Thank you.